Hello YouTubers, welcome to Big Buddha is watching, I'm Big Buddha and this is my final Alan Partridge video that I'm going to do, at least for the moment anyway. It's on the feature film Alan Partridge Alpha Papa, which is a title that Steve Coogan didn't like. He wanted to call the film Alan Partridge in Hectic Danger Days. And I have to say, say I, I agree, I think that would have been a much better title. Because it's... The idea was to take Alan Partridge, a very uh, rural, very British sitcom character, and basically throw him into the middle of a... A, ho a Hollywood action movie, although a Hollywood action movie that takes place entirely in Norwich. And Hectic Danger Days is exactly what Alan would think would be a, a really good title for a, a Hollywood action movie. A very contemporary title in his eyes, even though it would have been contemporary back in 1994. Or maybe even earlier than that. The... Uh, the Making of is called Hectic Danger Days, so there's a little um, nod to it there. But yeah, I have to agree. I I didn't really like the title Alpha Papa. It's it's kind of it's clever, you know. A P. Uh, obviously, there's a, a big police presence in that. So um, A P Alpha Papa, and it, the uh, I guess the idea is that he is the Alpha Papa. It's it's about this. The plot of the film is uh, Alan basically becoming the top dog and using uh, the the awful situation that he finds himself to his uh, to his own advantage. Um, the the film came out in twenty thirteen, so it was eleven years after the last series of I'm Alan Partridge, and uh, it was a really long wait for new partridge stuff they but, but they didn't rush into it which i i always think it, a lot of people are disappointed when you don't have something you like on an annual basis but i always think the the more you wait for something the the better a lot of the time because uh the the, the gestation periods for projects um a really benefit I think along uh, development time and uh, I, I'd rather, rather wait for something uh, and for the, the creative team involved to really hone something in and get it right and, um, uh, and so I, I wasn't that disappointed that they they really made the fans wait so long for the feature film because they've been talking about it since about 2007 and so there was a, a real there was from announcement to actually seeing the film there was a six year wait to uh, whilst they developed the material and came up with a good story and a good screenplay and um uh, uh, whereas uh, you know, other friends of mine were sort of chomping at the bit, saying, "When's this film going to come along?" I I really uh, didn't mind the wait because I, I thought, okay, that as long as they're developing it and um, come coming up with something that won't disappoint the fans, then uh, then I'm happy to wait. Um, it's funny then that um, I, 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 you know. John Cleese, I think, really is the. Um, it, it was really the person they were probably trying to emulate because he doesn't. He's somebody else in the world of comedy that doesn't rush projects out. You know, there was uh, there was uh, after he left Monty Python, he, um, there was a, a bit of a wait for Faulty Towers, and there was a four year wait between series one and series two of. Faulty Towers, which is something that was just unheard of at the time uh, in in BBC comedy, and then after Faulty Towers, um, the next logical step was for him to do a feature film. But that he he spent he waited thirteen years before he wrote a, a feature film, A Fish Called Wanda, and that film came out in nineteen eighty eight and. The long gestation period really produced a comedy classic, in my view. Um, it's a shame, then, that 
Although I don't think that this is a, a bad film by any means, it's. Um, I was really surprised then how much I wasn't completely bowled over in love with the film. Um, and I, I was also really surprised when I watched the making of to see them writing a lot of it on the fly, like literally in the time off from when they were filming it, they'd be uh, rewriting the script and, um, or well, I, I guess rewrite doing rewrites based on uh, <clears throat> what would come up on the day and uh, improvisations and what have you. Um, but I was really surprised that they didn't go into this with a fully formed script because they certainly had a, enough time to, to, you know, come up with a fully formed script in the eleven year period between I'm Alan Partridge series two and Alpha Papa hitting the cinema screens. Um, well, I'll, I'll I'll get into it because, um, you know the. It is a good film. It is a really funny film, but it's um, I do I do have some issues with it. Um, first off, I, I think it was the right decision. It, if you watch the um, the commentary on Know Me Knowing You, uh, which was done prior to them making the film, Amanda Iannucci says jokingly, "Oh, we never did the film, did we? We never did Alan in L.A.," which I, I guess is a a kind of um, nod towards the Mr Bean movie, which was, oh, let's just uh, take a, a very British character and take him to LA and that's how we'll a appeal to the American market. Here they they made the very gratifying decision to make a film geared entirely towards the British market. They didn't uh, allude to... Uh, American things at all they uh, you know down to little things like they use the word um, sack pat instead of fire pat or they they would have jokes about uh, Bruno Brooks you know and, and very very British things that uh, Americans uh, wouldn't necessarily pick on up on you know cultural bit very British cultural references in there so I think it was um, the, the right decision not to do the Alan in L in L A plotline. What uh, what they did do is really the the only logical uh, thing to do for a film because the character doesn't necessarily lend himself to being in a, a feature film. So to put him in uh, what is this, essentially a, an action movie or a, a dog day afternoon scenario is. Um, is really putting in Alan into a, a situation where he's uh, where, uh, suffering that he's never experienced before, and s putting him into a very filmic situation uh, where they could mine the humour for uh, like the same way in, that they did in Hot Fuzz, um, have a, a very British cosy take on uh, and on a very uh, American movie trope which is well in, in Hot Fuzz it was the action movie here it's the the siege movie so there, there was lots of good um, chances for, for humour in there um, I think where this movie really scores well is the, the set pieces which the, the comic set pieces which the, there are about three or four really good ones in the film and uh, I like I said, these were the obviously the bits that must have been planned out beforehand. So the, these were really the bits that they they must have come up with in the development time. And for me, they're the the strongest elements in the film. You get um, you know this the scene. You get all the the lead up to the siege. The basic plot is uh, Alan realize he's going to get sacked because there's new heads coming into Radio Norwich or um, North Norfolk Digital as it is at this time and uh, and changing things up and he he realizes that he's probably becoming a bit of a dinosaur in his life in in a lot of people's eyes and he realizes that um, there's, there's a decision afoot to either sack him or another DJ on the station. So he basically persuades the uh, bosses to 
to um, sack the other DJ who does the midnight slot on um, North Norfolk Digital, a guy called Pat Farrell, played by Colm Meany. And, um, and uh, through, through his actions, Pat Farrell ends up getting fired, not him. But then Pat basically comes to the, the relaunch party with a sawn off shotgun and takes everyone hostage. So you get the, the hostage situation. Um, so, uh, so everything leading up to that point is great. And then you get a very funny scene where Alan first realizes that he's, uh, he's in a hostage situation and he accidentally clobbers his sidekick, sidekick Simon, played brilliantly by an actor called Tim Key. Um, and uh, he, he clobbers him with a, a fire extinguisher. Sidekick Simon gets put upon and bullied in, in almost the as much as... Um, how are you coming on? Almost as much as Lynn does in the series. Um, you get a very funny dream sequence where you think it's all real, where you think that uh, during the uh, hostage situation, Alan gets the better of uh, Pat Farrell with, with his shotgun and um, you get this chase through the radio studios and it, it culminates in with Pat getting uh, shot down and then you think it's all for real but then the the uh, policemen take off the helmets and they're all Alan Partridge and you realise it's a dream sequence. You get this hysterically funny scene where Alan gets locked out of the radio studio but uh, at one point but because he's kind of um, sort of uh, becoming master of commander in there and really um, he, he can really see how he could, his career could advantage from him being in the situation that he's in in the hostage situation that he he um, he tries to get back in but in doing so he ends up losing his trousers and then um, the police see him and uh, tell him to stick his hands up but he's got no trousers on so he has to cock it <laughs> cup his cock and balls between his legs and then it gets papped and uh, it, it goes all around the media so he goes from being um, the the star of the day the hero of the day to being a, a national laughing stock and uh, you know a hysterically funny sequence I mean that's the one bit in the film that I was absolutely gasping for breath um, laughing at um, when I first saw it, it was, it's it's such a funny sequence, and then you get this really funny bit at the end of Alan trying to escape. Uh, they're in the van at, the, um, at this point, and uh, he tries to escape through the chemical loo, but he gets trapped in there. And uh, Pat finds him, and uh, at this point, Pat has realised that it was Alan that got him fired. And you think just for a second, just for a second. He's going to do a shit on his face. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so great comedy set pieces. Um, I I wish there'd been some more of them. You know, I wish they'd, uh, they, they'd come up with some more and peppered them throughout the film because that's the the point where the film really comes alive for me is in those moments. Um, where where the, the humour... Where the film really falls down is is really in the, the bits in between the the um, is really in the bits in between the um, the set pieces for me, which is the. Uh, it's just the little gags and Alan's quips that were obviously born out of monologues and improvisations on the day and the humour that's derived from real life, which because they try and derive the humour from real life, um, the a lot of it feels kind of weak and, and throwaway for me. Um, you know, there are some funny bits but they're, they're kind of pithy and I know the the by this point Coogan was 
working more uh, less and less with Amanda Ionici and Peter Bainham, although they do have a writing credits on, on the film. The, the majority of the film was written by him with Neil Gibbons and Rob Gibbons, the writing brothers that he wrote Mid Morning Matters with. And uh, I think the it's a shame because, uh, I mean, they're, they're good writers, but the, the film could have really benefited from... Uh, really solid gag writers in like Ianucci and Bainham who were really good at coming up with really well crafted well honed jokes rather than the pithy nature and the, the sort of on the fly nature of the humour that's more inherent in the Gibbons and Coogan's work so um, yeah I think I think the uh, the set pieces and uh, are fine, but the the gags sort of linking the set pieces together are uh, could have been stronger. Um, so it's a bit of a shame. Um, also, I, I've always I thought it was a kind of a missed opportunity. Um, the whole Alan using the hostage situation to further his career element to the film. I. W when I realised that that was the plot, I thought, okay, there's there's an opportunity here for um, them to go really dark and really acerbic, like they did in the TV series, and um, have Alan basically in a situation where people's lives are at risk, basically having to choose his career over his humanity. And uh, I guess that is the central theme of the film, and... The, uh, be it being a film, it get, I can't, kind of has to have a redemptive ending. But I, f I felt they could have really gone darker with uh, that uh, if that was the subject matter. So that was a bit of a, of a missed opportunity for me. Um, but you know, the 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 film does have wonderful moments, and the the when the film uh, works, it really works. It really works well, and it's really funny. the The final twenty minutes of, the, of this film are are absolutely wonderful. You get um, Alan with a, an air rifle um, on a pier in. Uh, on the coast in, of Norfolk at the end of the film and um, he's trying to elude Pat Farrell and he, this is the point where um, Alan the action hero really action hero really comes to the fore and you get a very um, funny standoff between the two at the end Carl, like I say Colm Meany's Mino's absolutely excellent in, in the role and uh, you could he, he, it would have been very easy just to play this uh, character of Pat Farrell as uh, somebody who lo who's lost his marbles and mind that for um, for the laughs it's worth. But he, he he keeps the character grounded and he gives him a a good sense of humanity. And the film is surprisingly moving towards the end. There's um, a really perfect moment towards the end where Alan to um, where, where Colm Meany puts the shotgun in his mouth and uh, Alan has to talk him out of it and um, he does it with a, um, a surprising amount of humanity and then he, he starts to sing You Were Always On My Mind to, to him um, to make him feel that uh, you know it, his life was worthwhile and, um, and it wasn't all in vain and it, it's a very very moving moment and uh, the, the film does end um with the uh, the classic brush of death and the, for a moment you know I, when i first watched it i thought oh my god is this it you know is this uh, is this the end of alan so uh, you know the, the final 20 minutes are really strong and when you have a final uh, an end to a film that's really strong i think you um you go away with the impression of a a strong film overall um, but the favorite, my favorite part of the film, though, being an Iron Bell and Partridge fan, is the uh, is the appearance from the characters from the TV series, because so, you have Dave Clifton in there, um, played brilliantly by Film Cornwall, basically describing all the or the had established at this point that um, Dave Clifton is off the booze and off the drugs, and uh, you get some very funny moments of Dave Clifton describing the the awful stuff that's. 
uh, he did when he was on the booze and on the drugs. Um, Felicity Montague is always a delight as Lynn and my um, oh, I forget the night my the actor's name, but the guy who plays Michael is is really good and uh, oh you get you get a very 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 funny wrap up to his character in this. Um, you you get the this sense I I get the sense I may be wrong but um, I think like I said Peter Bainham as the a co writer credit on the film and I, I I suspect if he wrote anything in this film it was the Michael moments there's uh, there's a there's a very funny moment with a Tupperware box and Michael and talk about um, Michael not not having to have bought loo paper for 18 months now and these feel very very much like Peter Bainham moments you know Peter May Bainham added elements to the uh, the more sort of gross elements to uh, Alan Partridge like his flaky skin and you, you can see that he, he obviously revels in sort of uh, icky gross humour right back from him playing Peter on Fist of Fun the the scuzzy lifestyle expert um there's talk about doing a sequel to this or another Alan movie, and um, and I, it'll probably be another eleven years before uh, before they crank that one out. I think there's um, I really would like to see another Alan Partridge movie because I think there is room for improvement. Um, it's uh, it's not a bad movie. It's a very very funny movie in places, but. I, I kind of wanted more from it. Um, I, I kind of wanted it to be a rich chocolate box of of uh, Alan and um, Alanisms all the way through. And for, for every great moment and great scene, there's there's kind of um, there's another scene that that feels underdeveloped and um, and just too pithy and. Uh, lacking in the real oomph of, of uh, clever sophisticated gags so I, I really i hope they do another film and i really hope they they bring Iannucci and Bainham back into the fore or even patrick marber um to really hold some great moments but um but at the end of the day you know it's alan partridge and um you know anything that Coogan wants to do with a character I'm there and uh, I'll lap it up in love uh, so there you go that's uh, my review of Alpha Papa uh, down uh, sorry I stumbled on my words through that one but um, it, when, when I do two in a row I uh, I, I tend to be a bit lacklustre about the second one so <laughs> I'll watch it back now and see how it went um, so until next time, um, I think my next video might be Night of the Living Dead. I think I'll look at a few. There's, um, George Romero died yesterday, so I, I want to look at a few of his films because I, I'm a big fan of, uh, well, especially his um, his first three zombie movies. So I, I might look at them and maybe the later ones as well. Who knows? But until next time, this is me, Big Buddha, signing off, and I shall see you all out there in YouTube land.